So will there be significant movement? Will we get real change? Uh, there's been a tons of legislation for a decade that's basically said to people inside the public service, the army, police forces, hospitals, listen, if you leak stuff, information to the media, you're not going to have too many defences. That's gone on for quite some time. Now that there have been raids on a journalist's home and raids on the offices of the ABC, there does look like, I think, maybe some genuine political appetite to give the leakers and the publishers perhaps some more protection. So those issues of press freedom that aren't really nearly as important as the freedom to stand on a rooftop and say, hey, by the way, I think something's rotten where I work. Are we going to get progress on those issues? 1300 774 And there's a union leader that, I guess, how many people have heard of John Seth? Because some people, he is the bete noir for some. He is the epitome of everything that's wrong with unions for others. He's digging in, though. He's the head of the construction union here in Victoria. They do, of course, represent other workers, but it's construction that he's best known for. He's refusing to go. He says he's been misrepresented. The Labor Party is kicking him out of their party, but that doesn't mean he will go from the union. So we will ask James Patterson from the Liberal Party and Tim Watts from the Labor Party what they make of it, but should John Sacker go? 1300 774 Do we need more protections for the media? And if you're somebody inside a government institution, state or federal, do you need more legal protection so that you can hand something over to the media? Or are there enough places for someone to blow the whistle? 1300-222-774. Okay, let's begin. I'm going to start by asking you a couple of test questions just to establish a baseline. We'll start with an easy one. This was a great outrageous lie. The number of falsehoods, assertions and fictions. We see that as a blatant lie. That is just a lie. Now go ahead and say something that is true so we can properly calibrate the machine. The Polygraph. Joining me in the studio is Tim Watts. He is the ALP member for the seat of Gellibrand. How are you going, Tim? Very well, Raf. And in fact, you got a promotion. What's your other title? You got um, some responsibilities. I am newly the Shadow Assistant Minister for Cybersecurity and the Shadow Assistant Minister for Communications. I would rather be a backbencher in a Labor government, Raf. But um, I'm happy for the opportunity to contribute with making that a reality in the future. And James Patterson joins us. First time, I think, on Polygraph. He is one of the Liberal Senators for the state of Victoria. James, good afternoon. Thank you for having me, Ralph. Have I left anything off your title? No, that's okay. uh, very good, good. Yeah, comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, let's have a listen. So, um, look, I've got to say, the scuttlebutt yesterday, union movement, Labor Party people, John Secker was going. Four, th- four o'clock, then it was six o'clock. He was going to do a press conference. He was going to go. He's not the kind of guy that backs down easily. Um, he has said today that he's going to plead guilty to a raft of charges over harassing a woman using a phone, calls and texts. He, though, says that he never said anything bad about Rosie Batty. And this is him saying he's not going anywhere. There's a fabricated false uh, things that I'm supposed to have said, and based on that, I should step down. I mean, why should I step down for, for something that, that is totally inaccurate and false and and, and just there are uh, manufactured... Uh, Lie. That's John Setka this morning. Tim Watts, um, is he going to go? Well, that's a matter for Mr Setka, Raf. Um, what I can tell you is that Anthony Albanese has made it very clear that he does not want him to be a part of a party uh, that Anthony leads. Uh, Anthony will move for the expulsion of Mr Setka at the next, next meeting of the National Executive. There wasn't even a party. quote about what John Setka said at that meeting, was there? The, the newspaper report said he disparaged Rosie Batty and said that men's rights had suffered as a result of her campaign. There wasn't even a direct quote. Is that, is that enough for Anthony Albanese to make that decision? Well, Anthony's made his position completely clear, um, and he has said that this is part of a, a pattern of comments. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that the Labor Party can't be clear on this. We are on Rosie Batty's side. I mean, I've hosted Rosie at Parliament House, and there's an absolute packed room in Canberra because there is a unity of support for her. The Labor Party at the federal level and particularly the state government in Victoria has led the nation um, in responding to the scourge of family violence. Now, the Royal Commission into Family Violence, initiated by the Labor government in Victoria, largely in response to Rosie Batty's advocacy, not what happened to Rosie's family, but Rosie's advocacy. But just to to return to John Sitka, this is not about anything he's been charged with in the past. And this is not about anything he might – so that's, in his, I guess, in his work as a, as a union official, he would say. And this is not about 
any of the charges he said today he was going to plead guilty towards. This is, he's been kicked out of the Labor Party only because of what he said about Rosie Batty. Is that the only reason? That's absolutely right, Raf. Um, any legal proceedings are completely separate to this. I, I might say as an aside, um, I see many in the government uh, trying to use this as a way of uh, disparaging the trade union movement. What I can say is the members of the CFMU are entitled to strong leadership, particularly in areas of workplace health, workplace safety. Um, the sad reality today is still that around once a fortnight, uh, a Victorian doesn't go home to their family because mm. they are killed on the job at a workplace. And the construction industry is by far the least safe industry in Australia. So they deserve strong representation. Um, the trade union movement plays a critical role in defending the interests of workers and the rights of workers mm. around health and safety and around wages. I mean, that ought to continue. What do you think is going to happen, James Patterson? You've been around politics long enough to make a prediction. Is he going to still be the head of the union next week? Watching his press conference this morning, he seems pretty determined to resist that. And I think Anthony Albanese has made a mistake in the, his decision to hang his expulsion on these reported comments in some private meeting. I mean, you and I, Raf, will never know exactly what John Satka said in that meeting. What we do know is that he's admitted, admitted in court uh, to harassing a woman. Uh, we know that he's got a rap sheet longer than either of our arms, uh, a serious criminal history. Uh, those would have been much stronger grounds to uh, warrant his expulsion from the Labor Party. Those would have been stronger grounds for him to step down as Secretary of the CFM. So are you Victoria. saying that Anthony Albanese is using the reported comment as an excuse? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. I, I can't right. read into Anthony Albanese's mind. I wouldn't try to. But I think he would have been on much stronger ground, as we saw in the press conference this morning from John Setka, who simply denied that these statements uh, were made. Uh, and that's what Anthony Albanese has said the reason he needs to go is. Well, w this is a bit of a stalemate. And even if he is expelled from the Labor Party, if he remains at the CFMEU in Victoria, he remains in a very mm. powerful position in the Labor Party, he controls a lot of votes at Labor's conference and will have a lot of sway in the Labor Party. So there's a real decision for the Labor Party coming up. If he is to remain... Uh, as the head of the CFMU in yes. Victoria, uh, will they continue to allow them to affiliate to the Labor Party? Is he powerful in the union in the Labor Party, Tim? Well, he's not a member of the Labor Party, right? No, no, his, but his still, membership has been suspended. He'll unions, be expelled at the next. Unions meeting. are a part of the Labor Party, so when you say have conference, the CFMEU, MM, the CFMMEU would have some votes at that conference. I assume if he stick, sticks around, whether or not he's a member. Is irrelevant, doesn't he? he? Still gets to control the votes. If he's no longer a member, he's no longer able to participate in the forums of the party, um, can, and that has happened. From phone. that has happened already. He's been suspended. Mm. He will be expelled. I expect at the next mm. meeting of the national. Either of you met him? No, I haven't. But I mean, the question, Raf, is: Would you really want to have an organisation headed by someone like John Setka affiliated to your political party? Um, whether he can well, attend a conference himself or not? Well, I think they should. If he remains head of the CFMU in Victoria, I think they should disaffiliate. I mean, if the CFMU says that's the kind of leader we want, right. surely the Labor Party says you're not an organisation we want affiliated with us. You don't want to make a prediction, Tim, on whether or not he's still going to be there next week. It's a matter for Mr. Setka and for the CFMU. Quarter past five, ABC Radio Melbourne, uh, 1300 774 is the phone number. There's John, maybe to think John Sick is completely irrelevant. Um, politicians in the media have been talking about him. Uh, why do you journalists insist on finding negative things to talk about Labor? Yes, they could, should resign, but the billion people on the front lines of climate change is far more important. Talk to the LNP about that instead. Might get to the uh, emissions figures that came out during the week. Let's get to Stephen Doncaster first. What did you want to say, Steve? This is Press Freedom. Uh, yeah, good day, Raf, and to your guests. Look, I just wanted to say I find it highly ironic, not to say laughable, that a News Limited journalist gets her uh, flat searched and the ABC offices get searched and suddenly the entire journalistic crew in Australia are in a froth over whether or not we need new laws to protect whistleblowers and the journalists who deal with them. And at the same time, in the same week, Julian Assange, it is now revealed, as everyone has always said it would be, is to be attempted to be extradited to the United States to face charges that he could go to jail for life for, as many of his supporters have yes. said now for a year. So you're accusing the media here of hypocrisy, Steve? Dual standards. Yeah. I mean, if if uh, what is it about what Julian Assange revealed about the behaviour of the American military and the diplomats around the world that we think we shouldn't have been allowed to know? 
Let me Back turn that into a question if I can, Steve. I'll, I'll start with you, James Patterson. You're part of the government. I do want to get on the media friends, but just briefly on Julian Assange. With what he did in 2010, that's what he's wanted for in America. Was that journalism? I, I would draw a pretty sharp line of distinction between uh, what you and your colleagues do here at the ABC, uh, what Annika Smithhurst and her colleagues do at News Corp, and what Julian Assange does. Um, if that's journalism, I think it's a very different kind of journalism. Uh, you carefully assess um, what is in the public interest and what should be published and what not should, be, should not be published. You go around and, and double-check the information that you receive. You go through the normal journalistic processes. Uh, Mr Assange receives leaks and puts them up on the internet for all to see, and some of those uh, documents that he has carelessly uploaded uh, to the internet, uh, we believe has exposed uh, people who've mm. been sources, for example... For... Well, that's contested, isn't it, about whether or not he put people in danger? Well, I, I, I don't know the truth of it. Well, sources uh, that assisted the coalition mm. in its war on terror in the Middle East yes. uh, were exposed through Mr Assange's So that is the difference for you? I think that's a pretty okay. verifiable difference. Tim Watts, do you agree with that? Well, there is another significant difference uh, on the facts of the, the Assange matter, and that is in the original uh, charges pressed against Mr. Mr. Assange by the Americans. Um, it seems to be what they're alleging is that Mr. Assange assisted his source with hacking into the, the systems of the uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, organisations. Yeah, that's encouraged sources all the time. Uh, computer hacking um, and stepping people through that um, may be a different matter. That's it, well, the how, allegation. How is that different? I, I meet with you, Tim Watts, because you are, I don't know, you got a well, job at ASIO or something. Computer hacking is a crime. I, um, understand, I understand that, but it's a crime to give me. It's a, it's definably a crime to give me information from inside a government are, agency, are, isn't as, it? If and this is what is alleged, yeah, I, yeah. As, as we understand it, um, you're assisting someone to hack into a computer system. That is a step beyond uh, what you'd okay. see as garden variety journalism. I should say though that any action taken against uh, Mr Assange shouldn't set any precedents for journalists like you, like people at the ABC, like people at News Limited, for that example, in a way that impedes their ability to play their very okay. important role in our democracy. Can I ask James Patterson, um, the view of some in the media is that we already know what we need to do. Someone, One of the senior people from News Corporation was on AM this morning, Campbell Reid, saying, look, we don't need an inquiry. You just need to implement a raft of committee reports that have already been delivered by government-dominated committees. Personally, where do you stand? Do you think there's a whole lot of ideas that committees have recommended that we should just place into law? Campbell Reid and others in the media might know the changes that they would like to see to um, law in Australia to facilitate press freedom, and I'm a big supporter of press freedom, and I'm an advocate of a parliamentary inquiry to look into that. Um, but I'm also a big believer in proper parliamentary process. I think good policy follows from good process. And I think shortcutting that process and saying we don't need to have an inquiry, we don't need to examine these issues in light of the new information that we have as a result of the events of last week um, is a mistake. I think if we jump through that process and go straight to legislative I, change... Can, can, can I just interrupt? I'm not saying I'm a big believer in process as well. I'll give mm -hmm. you one example. The Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security have a recommendation. Um, I'm going to summarise it. It essentially says that a whistleblower in the public service should have the same protections as a whistleblower in the corporate world. There are some relatively new protections for people blowing the whistle on a big business like a bank. They don't apply to the public service. They're the sorts of things that news and the independent centre are saying, look, we've had the process, we've got the idea – Let's just do it. Do you, do you support that idea? Uh, personally, I think there is a very good reason to think why you would treat a whistleblower in the public service and a whistleblower in the corporate world differently. For one, public servants, unlike people in the corporate world, have access to classified information. They also enter into agreements when they go to work for the public service voluntarily that they will keep that information classified and confidential. It is not up to them to decide on their own what should be declassified by being leaked to the media. So I think there's actually a good reason to differentiate about types of whistleblowers, but I'm not averse for that issue to be re-examined mm -hmm. in a parliamentary inquiry. Tim Watts, and, and I'll, I'll get back to James on this idea as well, but I don't want to talk about journalists too much. Do public servants need a greater legal protection, something like it was in the public interest if they get hit with a sanction? Is that something that public servants need, a greater public interest defence? So, Raf, I, I think we should start by, by pointing out that there, there are certain things, uh, certain information held by government that does need to be kept secret. Sure. 
I mean, that's the reality of it. You'll, you'll see some extremists or maximalists at one end saying that, you know, people ought to be able to leak anything they want if they believe that it is in the public interest. Like, we ought to say, state from the outset that that really isn't the case. There are certain sure, things sure. that can result in loss of life, in, in security threats, and a whole range of, uh, you know, very serious um, damage to the public interest. Yeah. Um, there are existing whistleblower regimes available um, in Australia. I've heard many people say that they're, they're complex or difficult to um, have avail people. Uh, a judge just wailed into one yesterday, didn't they, saying it was too complex for the whistleblower to navigate. That, that, that's right. Um, and I think in, in light of recent events, it is worth um, you know casting an eye over this. Now, the appropriate way to do that um, is, as James says, to get the parliamentary committee processes to really run the ruler over this. There are significant amendments that uh, have already been recommended by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on uh, in, in Intelligence and Security um, that have not been implemented, um, and it's worth looking at that. Um, I have a personal interest in a swath of uh, amendments from the uh, Assistance and Access Bill um, that ought to be implemented, in my view. One of the security pieces, yeah. One, one of the security pieces. Um, but the, the Parliamentary Committee process is a good way of, of ventilating this issue. It's just another talk fest, though, isn't it? I mean, I, no, I, no, no, I, no, Raph, I think it's a process, but... There's a raft of recommendations from committees that are just sitting there on the shelf gathering dust. Isn't that a problem? Circumstances have changed, and we have to examine uh, potential amendments in light of those changed circumstances. I think it'd be irresponsible of us to shortcut that process and just leap straight into an amendment process. The, the this joint... is really complex areas of law. I understand, and but we're Rex also Patrick, with... you said circumstances have changed. They haven't changed that much. What Rex Patrick is talking about, that Joint Standing Committee on Security and Intelligence, that stuff, I think it's like six months old. Yes, some of it is, and some of those amendments relate absolutely nothing to the yeah, events no, of last week. We We're could pass at a those whole amendments. Of laws. No, this is an important point, though, Raf. We could pass those amendments, and what happened last week could happen again next week with no True. changes at all. That wouldn't be very satisfying for the critics of this process. So I think we owe it to them to take this in a serious and sober way and have a careful examination of well, all the issues involved. One thing that we could do, though, is adopt the recommendation of the Independent Intelligence Review from 2017 that the PJCIS has a broader oversight role. So it's not just reviewing security legislation. Uh, brought before it by the government, but it is also providing oversight of yes. our intelligence and security agencies. There is a gap in the Australian system about the oversight. We are different to other uh, democratic countries in that respect. No doubt. The committees don't have nearly as much power here. That's my two cents. Uh, just some of your texts. John Seck is unsuitable to associate with Labor, but Clive Palmer owing workers $50 million is fine to associate with and influence the election. Oh, to be born with a silver spoon. That's from John and Lizzie saying, this man, I'm not sure who it's addressed to you, conflates security with important checks on probity. We've seen plenty of examples of senior public servants cheating and stealing from the public purse. There you go. It's from Lizzie in Heighton. Uh, Peter's in Donvar. What did you want to say, Peter? Look, it's entirely obvious why the ALP and the ACT won't disaffiliate uh, the CSMU and John Seck. It's all about money. The guy's one of the biggest funders of the ALP. He's a thug. The CFU, CFMU, a bunch he of He successfully thugs, sued matter. Tony Abbott for calling him a thug, Peter, so let's um, just well, try and dial no, that down. Because no, uh, you and record. I will get sued together. Well, let's just look at the record as to what he's done and uh, his actions and uh, the, amount of, the amount of criminal activity that he's been involved with. Okay. And it's, it's entirely obvious. Just but your your of... point is that it's the money that is the reason Labor won't disaffiliate. Tim Watts? Uh, Raf, I've said this before with respect to the CFMU. We share a mission as a Labor Party um, with the trade union movement. It's advocating for working Australians, for their safety, for their conditions, mm -hmm. for their wages, for their job security. Um, the CFMEU does a very good job advocating for particularly the workplace health and safety of people in the construction industry um, in Victoria and Australia. Like that is a mission that I'm yes. happy to share with the, that trade union. Two quick issues, if I can, that they are both very important, so I forgive me for treating them briefly. Firstly, we got yet another uh, update from the Energy and Environment Department that our emissions continue to go up. I think they've gone up for all of the past four years under your government, James Patterson. When will they start to go down? You're right, Raf. Uh, emissions are up slightly in the latest quarter, and that's partly attributable to increased LNG uh, exports. But the government's still confident that we'll meet our 2020 targets comfortably. In fact, we're going to beat them by about 367 when, when million tonnes. When are they going to go tons. down? Well, I don't have that for you, Raf. I'm not going to um, speculate on that. But we're confident we'll meet our 2020 targets, in fact, exceed them. Um, and we think our 2030 targets are responsible and achievable as well. Tim, are they going to meet their targets? 
Oh, Raf, this just shows the cynicism and arrogance of this government. These, this data was deliberately um, withheld um, until after the election. The, the Senate had required the publication of this data before the election. That was ignored. Was it required at the end of May? It was required some time ago, <laughs> Raf. Um, and you know, that was arrogantly ignored by this government. Um, I frankly have no idea what their emission reduction policy is. They've got an emissions reduction fund. We're not seeing many reductions going on. Um, you know, how they meet those targets, Lord knows. I mean, I'm sure we'll see four or five more iterations of their climate change policy in the coming years if the last three years are anything to go by. James Patterson, there's been a series of people, including today someone apparently setting himself on fire in, a, in the detention centres that are clearly still part of Australia's responsibility. Um, we've got to do something about those people, don't we, that we can't leave them there? It's incredibly troubling, Raf, and I'm particularly disturbed by the fact that this has been linked in the media uh, to the result of the election. Um, I really wonder what uh, people were telling uh, those people on Manus Island and Nauru would change uh, at the result of an election because the Labor Party said that they had the same policy as the government in the election. So how, how are you going to get them off? How, or how are you going to stop them trying to hurt themselves? Well, I think we need to provide them with the best medical care that we can and we need to continue to try and find third country resettlement options for them because uh, clearly we don't want people in the serious nature of distress that they're in. Tim, what is it going to change? Raph, they shouldn't still be there. It's been five years. Uh, if the New Zealand offer was taken up five years ago, there would be no one left there. I mean, th th this is the reality of this situation. It's it's a horrible blight on our country, what is happening there, and it is a re result of the deliberate policy and action of this government. Like, these third country resettlement arrangements could have been entered into already. Any chance the parties will get together and that those circumstances might change? Well, as third country resettlement options um, have been entered into successfully for many asylum seekers. There have been many that have been resettled successfully in the in United America. States. Yeah. Um, and that's a great thing. I mean, imagine winning the lottery of life and getting a, a safety and insecurity in the United States. So for those asylum seekers, it has worked out. But I appreciate um, for those that are still there, that's not much comfort. Is anything going to change, Tim? I don't know. Is there? Would it make a difference? I don't know. If Labor and Liberal got together, would that make a difference to the outcome for these poor people? I mean, third country resettlement is the obvious option for these uh, people, Raph. That doesn't require uh, a bipartisan agreement. Mm. That requires this government to do its job and to enter into arrangements with other countries. You can pick up the phone to New Zealand now and deal with that. Just before I let you go, um, you should know that Marcia Neve is going to join us uh, in about five minutes' time. She, of course, is the Royal Commissioner. It was her Royal Commission on Family Violence in Victoria that really... Uh, kick-started and turbocharged the effort on domestic violence in this state. Marcia Neve uh, will be here in just a moment. So I want to ask both James Patterson and Tim Watts this, because uh, it's a question I want to put to her as well. You might be, I think you are less qualified to answer it. James, um, how will we know we've begun to successfully tackle the problem of domestic violence? I mean, we, we're clearly doing a lot. How will we know, oh, right, when can we start ticking boxes, do you think? Oh, you're right in your preamble, Raph. I am less qualified to answer that question than Marcia, and I'll be interested to hear her answer to that. I mean, the obvious thing is, is to look at the statistics of reporting to police, but um, that's complex because, in fact, in some ways you want increased reporting to police because it means people are coming forward. So it's a really tricky one to measure. Tim, how will we know we're making progress, or when, you know, when? Yeah, I mean, James makes a, a good point there, Raf, that the, um, we, we've seen evidence that the reporting of, of family violence increases the more we talk about it. Um, you know, it puts it in people's mind to, to act and to, to deal with these things. Um, you know, perhaps we can see that we're making progress when the number of deaths start reducing. Yeah, that's a, that's it's a terrible, thing. terrible thing to say. Um, but that, 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 may be, uh, that, that may be the, th the, the measure. But I'm interested to see what Mar Marsh has to say on that. Thanks for coming in, both of you. Thank you. James Patterson there and Tim Watts.